The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. I'm Maura Aarons Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever, the show that looks at the intersection of mental health and work, and how we can all do both better. Disruption. It's a great word. And if you work at a company, especially one that cares about innovation, you're probably familiar with the idea of disruption creating a new technology or new services or a new product in a way that truly changes an industry. Think blockbuster video to Netflix. When you disrupt yourself, says my guest, you're stepping back from who you are today to slingshot into who you want to be. Disrupting yourself is a mechanism of growth and change. But like trying to enact change at an organization or trying to change the direction of a large ship, disrupting your own career and your life comes with struggle. How do you free yourself from anxiety in order to make big change? That's why I'm so excited to talk to our guest, Whitney Johnson. I've known her for about 15 years. We've shared our own journeys with anxiety, and I've followed her own personal disruption and her amazing career. Whitney is the author of books like Smart Growth, How to Grow Your People to Grow Your Company, and she's the CEO of the consultancy Disruption Advisors. I speak with Whitney about how she thinks about personal career disruption, the lessons she's learned, and what to do when some of your dreams are a bit anxiety-inducing. I was reflecting... You and I have known each other a long time. When we met, you had just left New York City. You had, I think, recently left Wall Street and were working for Clayton Christensen. Mm -hmm. And you had a vision for your life. I'm just curious, like looking back on that 15 years, from my perspective, like you totally did it. (laughs) (laughs) Did I? You did I? Well, you did. Did I remember you saying at lunch, like, you know, I've been this finance person and I've been this business person, but you, your first book was called Dare Dream Do, right? Yeah, that's right. And you wanted to give people the tools to make big pivots in their life, to make change. I love that reflection, Maura. You know, it's, it's, yes, that's exactly right. So I'd written Dare Dream Do and the genesis of that book was I started kind of writing it in 2007, 2008. And it came about because I had, as you said, I had worked on Wall Street and I had started as a music major and been quite successful. I was an institutional investor ranked analyst and super excited of like, I had this dream and I did this dream and and this is so fun. And and yet I was having conversations with a lot of women who were about my age and asking them, what's your dream? What do you want to do? And many of them were saying to me, well, I don't really have a dream. Or if I do, I'm not sure how to do it. But what I discovered as I listened a little bit more closely was they didn't actually believe it was their privilege to dream, which was very, I suppose, surprising, but also devastating in some ways. And so the book Dare Dream Do came about because I felt like I had something to say. I wanted to figure out what I wanted to say, but I also was wanting to talk to all these women who were contemporaries of mine, who were these amazing mothers, by the way, and um, rearing children and doing phenomenally well, but not having any dreams outside of being a mother and a caregiver and saying to them, I want you to go do these other things too, which by the way, I was learning from them how to be a mom. So I was saying, go be a ship. You know how to be a harbor, go be a ship. And I was saying, okay, you're really good at being a harbor. Can you teach me how to be a harbor too? And so it was this making meaning of my life to date, but also this conversation, this encouragement, this manifesto almost of 
women go out and have a dream. It is your privilege to dream. I remember you saying that, you know, all those years on Wall Street, you said, I, I don't even feel like I can yell at my kids because I haven't been with them enough. Mm. I probably did. In fact, I'm sure. I mean, I don't remember saying it, but I am not surprised that I said it because I think there was some element of guilt. I mean, without a doubt. But I do think that, you know, we talk a lot about imposter syndrome a lot, Mm -hmm. but I think that one of the biggest places that we feel like imposters is as parents. It takes a real sense of conviction, of moral authority to have limits for your children, to have boundaries, to expect things of them. And if you feel like you're not being as good of a parent as you want to be, at least for me, it was very difficult for me to hold those boundaries when I didn't feel like I was as competent as I needed to be as a parent. To have the banked up goodwill that you can yell at them. Uh-huh. Yes, <laughs> when they exactly. Need it. <laughs> exactly. That you have. Yeah, I love that. The banked up goodwill. Beautifully said. So when you then came off Wall Street and had a little more time for yourself. Were you able to create a new balance in your life, <laughs> being at home more? Or did, <laughs> or, or did you just realize that this you were onto something big? Yeah, tell us. <laughs> yeah. So I think the answer is yes and no. And I am creating that balance, but it was much more slowly than expected. So, you know, this is 2005. My children at this point are, you know, nine and five. So this is an aspiration that I had. I, I remember actually probably around, yeah, around 2005, I had a friend, her name is Kathleen Stone, come into our home and take pictures of us all day long at home. This is before, you know, we had phone photos everywhere, you know, of us doing home type of things and thinking, oh, she basically just created this lookbook, this image book of, of what I wanted the future to be of me spending more time with my family. And so that was gradually starting to happen, but that was now 15 years ago. And so what I would say is I have gotten better and better at this idea of work-life fit, better and better of having my life include work, having include family, having include volunteer work. But it wasn't like I flipped a switch and suddenly I was a different person. It's been this gradual evolution of me figuring out how to be a ship and a harbor simultaneously. Mm, I love that, a ship and a harbor. I want to talk about your personal journey, but but I want to frame this up because you are so well known for the concept of disrupting yourself. I think it's really interesting to think about how you manage or even free yourself from anxiety in order to make change. That's a topic I'm obsessed with. But I'd love you just to explain to the audience as succinctly or what, however you want to, what is disrupting yourself? Mm. Yeah. So for those who are not familiar, disruption is a term that was coined by, or disruptive innovation was coined by Clayton Christensen at Harvard Business School. And I had the tremendous privilege of working with him for the better part of a decade. And the idea of disruptive innovation is a silly little thing that takes over the world, like a, the telephone did to the telegraph, did, like the automobile did to the horse and buggy, like Netflix did to Blockbuster and now cable TV. That was the insight is that something that seemed silly, that seemed like a toy that no one took seriously by creating this new value chain over time would end up disrupting the incumbent. So David, you know, overturns Goliath. Mm -hmm. Well, the big aha that I had, and this is the article that I wrote in Harvard Business Review back in 2012, was that disruption wasn't just about products and services and companies and countries. It was about people, that, Mm -hmm. that the fundamental unit of growth or disruption in any organization is the individual. And so I embarked on creating this framework around personal disruption. And basically, it's a mechanism by which you make progress when you disrupt your the, the, the big difference between personal disruption and disruption in a company is that you are Netflix and your blockbuster. You are um, <laughs> the telephone and the telegraph. You're the silly little thing and you're taking over the world because you are actually disrupting yourself. You're stepping back from who you are today, how you do things today to slingshot into who you want to be. So it's this this wonderful mechanism of growth, of change. So that's a very simple way to describe it is step back from who you are to slingshot into who you want to be. You're you're a pretty anxious person, right? Yes. Would you say that? Absolutely. Talk to us first about your relationship with anxiety over your life. 
<laughs> so the way I describe it now is anxiety is like a fly. It's like always there. It's just a matter of where is it going to be? So that's, <laughs> you know, like you think you're going to swat it, but you're really not. Now, I know that I've definitely been anxious since I was a child. I, I didn't no to call it this then. I don't think people knew what that was really. But I remember so some early memories that I have around anxiety in retrospect are I remember being in third grade, I would get these really, really, really bad stomach aches, like horrific stomach aches. And I remember my mom taking me to the doctor and they're trying to diagnose like what's wrong with me. And and I remember the doctor saying to me, well, do you get, you know, straight A's? And I was like, yes. He's like, do you get A pluses? And I said, yes. And he said, how about if you start getting A's or A minuses? It's not very helpful, right? So that was that was the, the plan, just stop getting good grades. And then I also remember, um, this is really, really vivid for me, is I was a good student and I would like in third and fourth grade, so I'm eight and nine years old, I would beg my mom not to go to school. And so I have these happy memories of being at home Monday <laughs> through Thursday, sitting in my bed, reading Nancy Drew books, crocheting, you know, granny squares for quilts Monday through Thursday. Then I would show up at school on Friday because on Friday we had glee club and singing and I wanted to go take ice skating lessons. So I had to go to school on Friday. <laughs> and then the teacher would say, okay, so I know you've been gone all week. I remember Mr. Addington saying to me, so here's what we covered this week. We talked about adjectives. You've got a shirt. It's a red shirt. A red is an adjective. Good. You learned what we covered this week. You're great. And that was that was it. And so on the one hand, this was this beautiful, wonderful thing of my mom letting me stay home. On the other hand, and she would say so now, it was not a good thing because it allowed me to not deal with my anxiety. And by not mm. dealing with my anxiety, it obviously got worse. And so I remember Remember, you know, in college, I would have days where I would just completely shut down and just need to read a book because I wasn't able to manage and I still didn't know what it was. So it was very unmanaged and unknown. It was just, I can't deal with anything. I need to take a mental health day. Right. But at the same time, you kept achieving and moving forward. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> I mean, of course I kept achieving it. I mean, I, I know that sounds funny, but yes, of course. I mean, I graduated from high school. I had, you know, 3.96 GPA. I was number seven in my class out of, you know, 700 kids. You know, I played the piano. I got a scholarship to go to college. I, I was a cheerleader, like all those things. But the anxiety was very, very, very high. How did it carry through into your career? Mm. So, you know, I've had the benefit of, of reading an advanced copy of your book. So that's fun. <laughs> um, so I think that, you know, the, the boon is, is that the anxiety made me hyper vigilant, right? I need to be very aware. I'm going to work, 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 because I am going to get this perfect. And so I think it manifested by me, you know, I went into investment banking, which is a great profession for someone with high anxiety because you work all the time. I mean, and I would work 90 hours a week and think this is fantastic. And so it was good. And yet, so that's how it was manifesting. So my reflection at this point, and this has been just, I think probably over the last year or so, my anxiety helping me work harder or was I working hard to manage my anxiety? And that's not a good reason to work. And so that's been the big aha for me of, okay, I now understand that I have it. And I think I probably became, you know, years of therapy is very helpful and probably had a therapist help me understand that I had anxiety and what it was, I would say in the last 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. But that's been a big aha for me is do we work you know, does anxiety help us work or are we actually working to manage anxiety? Does the distinction matter? For me, it does. Because, so for example, if I have a day like tomorrow, tomorrow is Saturday, and it's a fairly freeform day, there's not things that I have to get done for Monday. And I could take a break. I can go do, you know, yoga or sit and read a book or take a walk. 
But if I'm trying to manage my anxiety, will I end up working, not necessarily because I want to work or need to work, but because it is the best way I have of managing my anxiety. So then the anxiety is managing me. I'm not in charge. And I don't think that's not how I want to live my life. The way you put it like that, it's so clear. <laughs> and I think so many listeners can totally relate to that. You know, there, nothing feels better when you're super anxious than to give your anxiety a task and get work done so that you feel like you're pushing towards whatever you're pushing right. towards. Oh, checklists. Those are the best. hundred percent. Like I'm a compulsive list maker. Like, let me make a checklist. Check, 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 because I feel better. So I think this is this is actually really helpful as well. So I have a younger brother and he had anxiety as well. And when he was probably 13, he started self-medicating. So so fortunately, I did not, uh, my self-medication was food. Hmm. Fortunately, I didn't start drinking or do drugs, but my brother did. And so he ended up having some really bad habits. He eventually got clean, but still had the depression, you know, anxiety, wasn't managing it well. And um, he ended up taking his life when he was 40 years old. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was very, very sad. And we all joke in my family that he was my mom's favorite child. And, you know, because he, and we don't joke. I mean, we all know it. it was like, it's true. And, and what's interesting, his name is Bryce, just this delightful, kind, smart human being, very generous and, you know, just very, very sad that he took his life. And, this sense of of loss of like, well, you know, what else might he have done with his life? And I remember having a conversation with with a therapist of like, well, he didn't accomplish what he was supposed to accomplish in life. And her comment, which is I thought was very wise, and I'll get back to the anxiety, is is but how do you know he didn't accomplish what he was supposed to accomplish in his life? Like we don't know what our tasks are of things that that we're meant to do. Mm -hmm. But I remember my mom saying to me after, you know, he passed away, she said, I think I did him a disservice. And this is when I started to get this sense is he wouldn't want to do things like he had a tennis match and he would want to avoid it because he was anxious. He's like 12 or 13. And she said, I did him a disservice by not requiring him to just walk through the anxiety. And I think that's when it started to really hit me of like she had, and unknowingly, right? She had no idea. She had unknowingly been complicit in allowing the anxiety to get the better of me, of him in general. And then another aha that I've had is I was listening to this wonderful, her name is Emma McAdam. She's a, on YouTube and she's a trained psychologist. And she said, anxiety is like a bear. When you have something that you are dealing with that you feel anxious about, like I said, I would go to this party and now I'm feeling super anxious and I don't want to go. Well, there's a part of your brain that says, you should cancel, you should cancel, you shouldn't go. I know you said you would go, but it's an hour before you should cancel because the bear is right there. So you cancel going to the party and you feel, phew, I feel so much better. I didn't go to the party. Your anxiety abates. But the problem is, is that the next time that you think about going to a party, you don't cancel one hour before you cancel 12 hours before, mm. or maybe you don't even say you'll go to the party at all. So the bear this time was four feet in front of you, but now it's 50 feet and then it's a hundred feet. And so over time you create this avoidance loop. And so it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And so the disruption is for me, the personal disruption is to face the bear. And so some things that I now do is I'm very careful about what I say yes to, mm. Because I want to make sure that once I say yes, I will do it. I want to trust myself. And also it's a way for me to manage the anxiety and not have the anxiety manage me. That's how I face the bear. The bear is such an interesting metaphor because a bear is, of course, huge and dangerous and wild. But we also kind of like bears. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, she didn't. She didn't say it was a crocodile. Right. That's true. That's true. She did not. <laughs> I, I. I mean, I only. I only say that because most of us have a relationship with our anxiety. It's like. Mm. It's like. Oh, hey. Hey. How are you? Okay. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. And bear. And, right. And we. Well. And think about it. Teddy bears. Right. That. That's actually. Mm. Oh, Maura. That is really deep. Is that like you said? It's not a crocodile. There's the teddy bear. We have a relationship with it. Hmm. There's something there. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life, a promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. So I, I love this question of am I letting my anxiety control me by acting out a behavior, an anxious behavior, when in my heart I want to do something else? Mm-hmm. Do people do that at work? Oh, I think all the time. I was thinking about this, and this is one of those things that's kind of hard to look at myself in the mirror. So I'm working at Wall Street, and this is like 2005, and I'd been institutional investor ranked for eight years, and I was ready to do something new. And I'd gone to my boss, and I said, hey, you know, I, I want to try something else. I feel like I'm at the top of my S-curve, my learning curve. And they basically said, you know, we like you right where you are. And I knew enough about personal disruption at this point to know, huh, I could disrupt myself and leave, which in fact I did. Now, hmm. Nothing wrong with that, right? This is my career. This is my life's work of teaching people how to disrupt themselves so that they can grow. Where my anxiety kicked in, and I think people do this all the time, is that it was too scary for me to actually think through what jumping off this curve was like, planning for it, thinking about what do I want to do next? How do I want to save my money around this? Mm. What does this look like? Because I was anxious, because this was scary, because I just couldn't look at it, I was pretty impulsive. I just quit and I didn't have a plan. (laughs) And it was foolish of me in retrospect because it put us in a very difficult financial situation for a few years because I... I just didn't have a plan. Now, I did the best I could at the time. But to your question, does anxiety show up at work? Oh, yeah, all the time. It also shows up. So so that's kind of a big thing. But I think about, you know, when you get that email that someone sends Mm -hmm. to you that triggers you and you shouldn't respond. Oh, my God. And you do. That's anxiety. (laughs) <laughs> oh my God. Well, the anxiety is the pit in your stomach you feel when you see the email, right? And oh, then the, yes. the response, a hundred percent. It's so funny. I always talk about that in my speeches and I, <laughs> I can see people literally feeling it in their stomach. Like there's the name, they know that name, it's in their inbox and it's just like, Oop. I can't look at it. I can't look at it. I can't look at it. I have to look so at terrible. it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like this is the worst possible news. Mm-hmm. And It's so interesting to me that someone like you who had obviously been so, I mean, the the fact that you didn't go to school is kind of interesting, but like, obviously you were very diligent that you just quit your job. Like that must have felt really out of character to a lot of people who do you. That's an interesting question, Maura. I never thought about that. I bet it did. I bet it yeah. did. I, uh, yeah, because I am very diligent on the Enneagram. I'm a one, which is a reformer. I'm, you know, I'm an oldest child. I'm a rule keeper. So, so I bet it did seem very odd that I would just up and quit my job that paid well, that had a measure of status and prestige and didn't have a plan. And again, though, back to your point, I think that anxiety causes us to do impulsive, sort of out of character things because we've gotten hijacked. Yep, it does. But that's a big one. It is a big one. It is a big (laughs) one. Yeah. Now, when you made, I don't know if it was your second big pivot, well, talk us through what happened mm-hmm. because you, when you wrote your first book, you were still employed by someone else, right? Like, what was the process where you were like, okay, this is going to be me. I'm going to leave outside employment and I'm going to try to make this work. Yeah. Whitney, Whitney Johnson, Inc. Yeah. So this is now 
2012. So as I said, I thought I left Wall Street for good in 2005. Then I connect with Clay Christensen at HBS and end up working with him on some volunteer projects, but then co-founded a fund with him and his his oldest son, Matt, and did that for five years from 2007 to 2012. Um, mm-hmm. In 2012, I had written that article, Disrupt Yourself. And I had this good fortune of being able to watch Clay speak and talk and and I've written Dare Dreams Do. So 2012, I've not only written Dare Dream Do, but also written Disrupt Yourself. And I don't know how to explain it other than to say, I think most people get to this point in their life if they're, you know, older than two, no, I mean, older than 30, probably of like, I feel like there's more for me to do on this planet. And I think that that was the experience that I was having is when I was still on Wall Street, actually, let me back up. I, I had this experience where we were doing this analyst training day. And I spent a lot of time figuring out how to train the analyst. I was thinking about American Idol. I was thinking about Tom Peters' article called A Brand Called You. And I realized then there was this sort of glimmer, this this foretaste of, I am actually more interested in the momentum of people than I am of stock. So this is like 2004, 2005. So this is now germinating, 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 germinating. 2012, I've written this article and I'm realizing, and Clay even said to me, Whitney, your heart is not in investing in companies. Like you want to be investing in people. Like I can see it. I can see that this is what you want to do. And you're right. It's a mat. I don't think of it as a massive pivot, but in fact it is because I went from being an investor to building a thought leadership practice around these ideas and now building a business called Disruption Advisors. But I think that- It's a huge pivot. It is a huge pivot, but for some reason I don't see it as one. Isn't that odd? Yeah. (laughs) But it is. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, just in terms of like where your paycheck came from. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And for a while, there wasn't much of a paycheck, right? Because when yeah. you're an entrepreneur, you don't have a paycheck initially. But were you anxious when you took this on? Because you, you had kids, obviously. You had yeah. all the responsibilities. Oh, yeah, of course. Of course yeah. I was. Of course I was. And well, I was. But you know where my anxiety really showed up, Mora, is that I was starting to do public speaking. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Talk about a seedbed for anxiety, right? <laughs> Everyone's favorite, yes. <laughs> but again, public speaking gave me a way to manage the anxiety, right? Because you're thinking about how do I want to show up? What do I want to say? Practice, 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 practice. How do I do this? And so I now had another channel or way a practice for me to figure out how to manage it. And to be honest, there were a couple of years that it was really tough because we're building this business. And surprisingly, though, I'm not recalling the anxiety quite as much in the 2013, 2014, as much around work as I am around the speaking piece, which I think is interesting. Like you put it all there. Yeah, I think so. I think so. That resonates for me also. I feel like as someone who's sort of newer on the thought leadership journey, but, you know, I don't get anxious around the work. I get anxious around the promotion of the work. And that's where all my anxiety, I mean, oh, the anxiety okay. I have about an Instagram post, you would not believe. <laughs> like, <laughs> Okay, so you totally you know, get what I'm talking about. I totally get what you're talking about. It's, yes. <laughs> Oh, the the Instagram posts that look like they were just, you know, showing up two seconds ago that we labor over and make sure we have to get the right light and all that good stuff. Oh, my God. I hate them. (laughs) But part of what you've identified as a key to disrupting yourself is to find your disruptive strengths. Mm. And I want you to talk about this because one of the problems with being anxious is that you can get stuck in thought traps, right? You can get stuck in fear of failure and I'm not worth it and no one's going to pay attention to me and all those awful cognitive distortions, which I feel like makes it really hard to step away and peel away the layers of the anxiety so you can identify what only you can do, those disruptive strengths. Yes, a hundred percent. And so I remember my mom telling me when I decided that I wanted to do this, do this work. She said, Whitney, you need to make sure that as you do this work, you are practicing what you're preaching because there's plenty of people in this thought leadership space that talk, but don't do. Mm. And so one of the things that I find is if I am talking about growth, right, the S curve, smart growth, I'm talking about disrupting yourself in order for me to have any 
congruence, any sense of moral authority. We used that word earlier. I have to be in the process continuously of disrupting myself, thinking about what am I going to do? How am I going to improve? How am I going to get better? And so that includes you know, figuring out how am I going to deal with anxiety that's like a fly? What does that look like? And so, you know, I I am constantly trying to think through this. I think about, I make sure I exercise because I know that the exercise helps me get rid of the cortisol. Mm-hmm. I'm a person of faith. And so I, I make sure that I think through, you know, I, I ask for help from God to help me figure out how to do this and also help me get the information that will help me figure out how to do this. And then I rely on work like Emma McAdams work. I'm now relying on work like yours, which helps me, you know, outline some things that I didn't know about. I recently found a fellow at Stanford named Shirzad Shamin who talks to saboteurs, which is helpful. I've been taking singing slash voice lessons. I've been doing yoga. I, I basically have made this commitment of how am I going to disrupt my mindset? How am I going to beat back that anxiety? How am I going to create space and quiet in my mind and in my heart so that I can make the progress that I want to make faster? That's the journey that I'm on, this journey of making space and understanding that the anxiety will never go away, but how do I manage it so that it doesn't manage me? I'm very productive. I get a lot done in the world, but if I can quiet the anxiety even a little bit, my productivity and and my happiness will go up. <laughs> let's not let's not mention, you know, yeah. happiness. I yes. know. I know. Yes. And so so basically I'm doing all those things. I'm on this journey. Someone played it back to me the other day of like, I'm in this journey of conscious growth. And I think that's absolutely right. But again, if I talk about disrupting yourself about growth, I have to be eating my own cooking. And that's what I'm doing. I think that's amazing. I also think then, of course, anxiety becomes a healthy piece of it because when you're taking risks and you're trying something new, you're going to be a little anxious. And that's okay. Yes, that's right. That's right. And there's a little bit of it because, you know, there is a bear there and you sometimes you want to bear hug it, but sometimes the bear is in fact dangerous. And so, but it's now the right size. It's not the wrong size. The right size bear. What else, what (laughs) else would you say to listeners who are thinking about, can I change Hmm. even though my voice is, yeah, I don't know, or whatever you want to say. Oh. What else would I would say? Yes. Pound the table. Yes, you can change. That is one thing that if you do not take anything else away from this conversation, 100%. I, you know, I wrote in my last book, Smart Growth, that growth is our default setting. And, you know, we can talk about neuroplasticity and all that. But I want to just say this at a more fundamental gut level. You know, have you ever met any two-year-old ever who doesn't want to get up every single time they fall down and try to keep walking? Like, we are wired to grow. And so while many of us and probably most people that you're listening to this podcast are struggling with anxiety, it doesn't mean that you can't manage it. It doesn't mean it won't be difficult, but you absolutely can. I mean, we were made to act and not be acted upon. So (laughs) that is something that I would definitely say is that you can work through this. And the fact that we have anxiety, actually, it's a gift because I think about sometimes, would I do all this self-introspection? Would I be so, you know, hell bent on becoming a better person if anxiety hadn't been here? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, and the self-awareness extends to your leadership, your friendship, yeah. your relationships, right? It, yeah. When yeah. you know yourself, you can be better for others. That's right. Absolutely. My final question is one that I've been thinking about a lot. And I think a lot of anxious achievers, and, and this is certainly a clinical definition for people who are, you know, maybe perfectionistic, is that the ball keeps moving down the court. So you know, you're a very goal-oriented person, right? You achieve X goal, you publish a book, but then it's about, well, did the book do this? Oh no, my next book better do this. And then you have to write the other book. And and the finish line never stops to give you a hug and say, you did it. Hmm. And that can be really hard because sometimes we unconsciously disrupt ourselves because we are just working that anxiety away. Yeah. I'm curious, like, what's yeah. your advice for that? Hmm. So I'll give you a a hack and then a more philosophical approach. So 
The hack is that I had had the habit of, I would make a list of, I'm going to get these 10 things done today. And then it would get to be one or two o'clock and I'd be like, great, I got those 10 things done. And then I would add five more things. So basically I could never win. Like I was always losing. And so I have worked and I'm working on when I make my list, once that list is done, I stop and say to myself, Whitney, you did everything on your list. Everything else, if you want to do it, you can, but you don't have to, you did it. You, you did what you set out to do. So that's my my first hack. Mm-hmm. I sometimes also write down things that I wasn't expecting to do so that I can add because we do unexpected oh, things in the course of a day. Okay. Right? So like, for example, you still have children at home. Like if one of your children comes in and says, hey, mom, I want to talk to you for 10 minutes to do X, Y, Z. It probably wasn't on your list. But if you write it down, you can be like, oh, I did that too. So that helps manage it as well. Oh, I like that. Yeah. So that's the first thing that I would say. The second thing that I've been thinking a lot about, and we actually just wrote a piece in LinkedIn this week, is called Mark the Moment. And stopping And when you get to the top of an S curve, which it might be a major project, but it might just be your day is stopping and saying, look at what I did. I did this thing and honoring ourselves and being willing to celebrate. And so one of the things that I do personally, I do in coaching sessions, we do at the beginning of workshops is just ask people to stop and celebrate and have gratitude because what it does is, as you know, it activates the parasympathetic nervous system. And by doing that, it allows you to say, okay, I did this. And yes, there's more stuff that I want to do, but it allows you to honor what you already did. And I think that that for me is one of the ways that I'm able to be in charge of the anxiety is yes, I know there are things I need to get done, but just to pause and reflect and honor myself and what I've done. And for people around me to do that, it, it makes a big difference. So that would be my my thought is to to mark the moment, to celebrate. And the hack is, you know, once you've gotten those 10 things done, then you got them done and the rest, you know, you're playing on the house, but you're, you're good. I love that. Thanks, Whitney. Thank you, Maura. That's it for today. Our show is produced and edited by Mary Dew. Our assistant producer and sound engineer is Nick Krinko. Many thanks to the LinkedIn Presents family and to all our guests for sharing their stories. If you love the show, tell your friends. I would love you to leave a review because they really matter in helping the show get found. You could also follow us or subscribe. If you have a question for me or you want to submit an idea for the show, find me on LinkedIn where you can follow me, message me, I promise I'll write back, or subscribe to my newsletter for more from the anxious achiever world. Thanks for listening.